uh, give you enough of these Sunday mornings I learn not to forget things that we need to do. Will you turn with me to the book of Job? The book of Job. A couple weeks ago, as Sister Dietrich back here testified that when she was ill, the Lord had been leading her to the book of Job. And she doesn't know this, but the Lord had been leading me to the book of Job at the same time. That's like how God works those kind of things. Yes. yes. And I, that's happened more times in, in our years in church that several people at the same time that God's been dealing with them on the same thing. But if you turn with me to the book of Job, chapter 25 and verse 4, I want to quote Bildad the Shuite. Bildad the Shuite said this, How then can a man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Father, we pray today that our hearts will be set free from all condemnation. That every sin will be washed under the blood of Jesus. And that we'll walk out of this place today knowing that we are saved, sanctified, regenerated, justified. We pray that we'll be full of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Bildad the Shuite poses a question that has troubled many a soul throughout human history. If you were to go to the, I, I don't like saying this term, but this is what secular, secularism says about the great religions of the world. There are no great religions, there's Jesus. There was an awesome Savior. But if you were to go to the major religions and even the minor religions, the quest for justification the quest to be cleansed is one that plagues the heart and soul of mankind. Every year at Easter, we see in some foreign lands, I, one, thing, one place I remember quite vividly is the Philippines, but they do it elsewhere, where people will crawl on their knees on the way to the, wherever they have the right to cross, and they'll be beating themselves in the back with a cat of nine tails, trying to show penance. St. Peter's Basilica was built with the penance of the European, the medieval European and early Central European people. They paid. They paid money to be atoned of their sins. We don't believe in penance as good, strong, Bible-believing, Pentecostal, Protestant people. We believe in repentance, and we believe in salvation. How then can a man be justified with God? You know, Job asked the same question in one of the earlier chapters. How can a man be justified with God? And Bildad repeats it here, and he says, How can he be clean that is born of a woman? Justification is what I want to talk about today. It's a hallmark doctrine of the Christian faith. When you look at the theology of salvation, that's called in theological terms, it's called soteriology. That's just the big impressive word. Am I kicking my cane or what am I doing? There, I, just, I didn't kick the bucket, but I kicked the cane. Uh, soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, can be described in three great truths. Regeneration is the first one. Regeneration is it's uh, when God's spirit has quickened inside of a man or a woman. What happens is if you were to go to Minick, I guess it's called Minick now, Funeral Home or Schultz Funeral Home or Diamond, and there will be, be a person there that has passed away, you can walk up to that casket and you can say everything you want to say and they won't blink an eye. They won't die an eye. Why? Because they are dead. You see, before salvation, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And in fact, Paul says in Ephesians, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's regeneration. You see, why, why is it that there are people in this world that it's so evident and plain to us about Jesus and about God, why isn't it evident to them? Because they're dead in their trespasses and sins. And it takes God's provenient grace, that period of grace where God is dealing with them to open up their senses, to open up their darkened heart and mind, to be able to receive the light of the gospel, and still then some still 
refuse to believe. It's what Paul said also. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, what is he? He is a new creature. That's regeneration. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 17. There's sanctification. Sanctification is the act of being set apart for holy use. Why did God save us? So that we might be set apart, sanctified for holy use. Now, first of all, we don't live unto ourselves anymore. It's the act of being made holy. Are you holy today? If you're saved, you are. You're holy. Positionally. You, a sanctified means to be a saint. Are you a saint? Yes, you are. I know in the Gospels you read where it says called to be saints, but in the original language it really says called saints. You are already a saint. You're already sanctified. Now, Sanctification is both positionally and experimentally, meaning we are growing in sanctification also. But we don't want to talk about regeneration, sanctification this morning any more than that. We want to deal with justification. Justification deals with the legal aspect of salvation, dealing with our guilt and condemnation. I have lived for many years battling condemnation. My sins bark at me like a junkyard hound dog. They pursue after me. Job said, how then can a man be justified with God? Or Bill Dad said, how can he be clean that is born of a woman? See, Bill Dad and earlier in Job recognized this one thing, that mankind is under the curse of of Adam's fall. How did I become a sinner? When did I become a sinner? In Romans chapter 5, Paul says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. I didn't like that verse when I was first dated. I didn't think it was fair. Why can one guy ruin it for everybody? Well, guess what? If I'd have been that guy, it would have been Dave fell in the garden. So that death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Remember the woman taken in adultery? That story always blows my mind. Well, you see Jesus and his compassion love for people, still yet being righteous and holy. And he gets down, they're all they're ready to stone her, and he gets down and he starts to write in the dirt. The pastor preached one time that that was the dirt that was on the floor of the temple. I always saw it was the dirt outside, but he didn't say pastor's work for him. They had so neglected cleaning of the house of God that there was dust and dirt. And he began to write on right in the dirt. <coughs> And the scripture says they left from the eldest to the youngest. And remember what Jesus said? He looked up at her and he said, Woman, where are thine accusers? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sit no more. Hey, Jesus. Sidebar. I love the book of Romans. Paul said, chapter 3, verse 10, we're just strengthening our point that there's no one in this world that's not a sinner. He says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. David said when he repented of his great sin with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah, did it just come out of my mouth? Adultery with Bathsheba and murder might not have been murder one, but probably was what the grave indifference to human life would have been murder, or the man slaughter or murder two, whatever. He's guilty. And for the better part of a year, David keeps his secret. Later he said, when I kept my silence, my bones were vexed within me. David's under the heavy hand of God's conviction. 
And later when David repents, he says to God, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Man is under the sentence of death because he was born in sin. It goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter 2. You know the story. We'll read it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And you know what he was saying there? He says, in that's what it means in Hebrew. In dying, you shall die. It was a spiritual death. What happened when Adam and Eve fell in the garden? They died spiritually. That's why we need regeneration. And it brought upon physical death. Why do we die physically? Because of the fall of man. Mankind, what happened in the garden when Adam fell spiritually, that was passed on to all of us so that man possesses a sinful nature. We know Paul said in Romans 7, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, soul under sin. No one ever needed to teach me how to sin. If there's one thing I'm good at, it is sin. I am a good sinner. I have not been a good dad at times. I haven't always been a good husband. I wasn't even a good third baseman when I played baseball. <laughs> Say that right now. But oh boy, I can sin. Hey? Come on now. Yes, sir. I know all the hex and darns. I've used them all. I ain't proud of that. There are some not even good at English. I am not proud of that. I am not. Does that have to define me? Well, we'll think about that for a moment. Romans chapter 8. I want to read it length to you. Just Romans 8, verse 17. Romans 8 and verse 17. And if children then heirs, if children then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, so we, we suffer that we may also be glorified together. I don't know if I got that right. I must have put the wrong one in. Hold on. It's chapter 7. The guy that typed my message not a good typer either. <laughs> Romans chapter 7, uh, verse 17. Now then, it is no more, I, no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Yeah. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Sin, S-I-N, big as I am. Sin, I'm talking about sins right now, poor, but sin, sin that dwelleth in me. I find that a, I find that a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law of my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? He's talking about the sinful nature. Now, the sinful nature can be in Scripture is referred to as sin. Sins, plural, are the acts of the sinful nature. I, I, I guess when I was first saved, I thought, you know, if only I could have never sinned, I didn't know any better at the time, I wouldn't have this sinful nature. No, I was born with it. Mm -hmm. The sinful nature is why I sin. The reason I commit sins is because of my sinful nature. Here's how one theologian, what a really deep theological explanation of all this. Here's a great theologian explained it this way. Sin is the hen. And sins are her chicks. Sins 
are the offspring of the sinful nature. So man, every, every man, woman, every child is not justified before God. They're guilty before God. Now it's hard to believe that little Billy Bob has a sinful nature. He's so cute there in the basket. But he does. Start talking to your grandchildren about Jesus as early as you possibly can. I knew a, a girl that I went to Bible school with. She's a missionary now, her, her husband. And her parents took in foster children. And you know what her mother would do? Her father was a pastor. And we, they're both now with Jesus, with the rich and and uh, his wife. I believe his wife's with Jesus. And, uh, he was in the same section we were in when we had our first pastor in Wilmore. Awesome man. Awesome man. Awesome woman. She took every child, every baby that came into their care, and she would read to them the Bible and tell them about Jesus and pray for them, even though they couldn't understand, she wanted to sow some kind of seed into the spirit of that child because they didn't know for how long that child would be in their home. Every person stands guilty before God. So we come back then. Man is stained. All of mankind stands guilty. They're, they're stained with sin. They're under the curse of the law. And what did John tell us in Revelation, what did he see? I think about this often. There are two, two great judgments to come in the future. There's the judgment seat of Christ, of which Paul calls the terror of the Lord. But then there's this other judgment seat that I pray to God no one ever in this room ever, ever experiences. In Revelation chapter 20, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were all judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's, that, that's a deep read. So all of man stands condemned before God. So we have to answer Bill Dad's question. We have to answer Job's question. How then can a man be justified with God? How can he be clean that is born of a woman? Years ago we used to sing with the kids in Sunday School Children's Church, My heart was dark with sin. Until what? Until the Savior came in. And in His Word I'm told, I walk the streets of gold a wonderful, wonderful day when Jesus came in to stay. Here's the answer, Mr. Bildad. Here's the answer, Mr. Job. How can a man be justified with God? How can a man that's born of a woman be clean? Here's the answer, Jesus. Jesus. Paul said in Romans 4, what did he say about Jesus? He was delivered for our offenses. And he was raised again for our justification. And justification means what? Just as if I had never sinned. Can you believe that? Awesome. The answer, Mr. Baldad, is Christ. And His perfect work on the cross of Calvary. And it didn't stop there, Mr. Bildad. He proved that what He did on the cross was legitimate because He came out of the grave on the third day. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, Adam was the first Adam, the first man. The last man, or the last Adam, is Jesus. Romans 5, 15. Remember I said I thought it was, it was unfair that one guy caused all this trouble in the earth. Ah, uh, here's the answer. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace 
which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. In Adam I fell, but in Christ I stand righteous and justified before God. Are you afraid to stand before God one day? I don't even like a monthly review at work. Maybe because I don't need it. That's what I tell them. I don't need it. I've never liked being called before the principal, the supervisor, No fear, my, my sainted friend. You are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank God. You're justified. We're justified by His grace. Not by works, lest any man should boast. I don't want to pick on Catholicism, but I'm going to say it anyhow. Catholicism teaches that you're justified by grace, but also by works. We don't believe that. We are Protestant. We stand on the, the three-legged stool of grace only, faith only, scriptures only. For by grace are you saved through faith and not that of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not a works as any man should boast. Paul said in Romans chapter 3, Being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. He set him forth to be a propitiation. Propitiation means the mercy seat. Propitiation means this, that a holy God was outraged and had wrath and anger for the sin of man. God is holy and he cannot abide nor stand sin. He cannot stand with sin. But this is what, remember what Isaiah said? Isaiah said about the coming Messiah. But we did esteem him smitten and stricken of God. Who put Jesus on the cross? Was it the Roman soldiers? Yes. Did the Jews turn on him, the Jewish leadership, and, and they put him on the cross? Yes. Did my sins put him on the cross? Yes. But I'll tell you who put him on the cross also. And that was his father. And with each blow upon his face, with each nail that was driven into his hands, each nail that was driven into his feet, he was smitten and stricken of God. And he took upon him the wrath that was intended for you and I. Yet we did esteem him smitten and stricken. What happened when he was on the cross? And he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He lost fellowship for a moment, for a time, because God cannot have fellowship with sin. It was the wrath of God being satisfied. I, I told you about those who would beat themselves on the back doing penance on Good Friday. There's no amount of beating myself on the back or beating myself up or putting myself down can atone for my sins. It all happened at Calvary. Yes. It happened in, in, in before Pontius Pilate. It happened with the soldiers of Herod. It happened on the road up to Golgotha as he carried that heavy cross, bruised and beaten and worn, his beard plucked out from 
him. His visage was marred above that of any man. He didn't even look human. My God, he hung there for three hours, atoning for the sins of the world and the sins of the world to come. He died for the people of his day. He died for the people who came before him. He died for the people that would come after him. He died for me. He died for you. I am cleansed not by my own good doings. There is within me no good thing, but by the blood of a precious lamb at Calvary's cross. And we read in the book of Hebrews about the blood which speaketh better things than that of Abel's. What did Abel's blood cry out for from the earth? It cried out for vengeance. But the blood of Jesus, it cries out for mercy. Mercy. We read in the Hebrews that he ascended into heaven. He went in there and on the true mercy seat, that's before God, it talks about the blood sprinkling. He sprinkled his own blood. And that blood is there today, as fresh as it was the day that it was taken into eternity. And God looks at that mercy seat and what does he see? Not a condemned Christian, not a condemned sinner. He sees the sacrifice of his son. Being justified freely by grace through redemption. We're justified by his blood. Romans chapter 5. Verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, what did Christ do? He died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. There's not going to be wrath for you and I when we go to heaven. If we're trusting in the blood of Jesus. Grace, that's what you know. I can imagine that moment we get to heaven, we're going to cry out grace, grace. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet saved. We are justified by not only grace and His blood, but by faith in Jesus. He that believeth on Him is, this is John chapter 3, He that believeth on Him is not condemned. Do you feel condemned for your sins today? Do you feel bad? Well, I'm telling you, I can't believe how I have fallen at times and how far short I, I have been. Listen, it's not just a mistake. These weren't just mistakes. These just weren't boo-boos. These were outright sins. I don't want you to know about them. You know why? Because I don't even want to know about them anymore. I used to tell people, my pastor, if you want to find the skeletons in my closet, come get me. I'll take you there. I don't want you losing my bowling ball while you're trying to get to my skeleton. <laughs> They're there. They're there. But he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten. Son of God. Salvation is realized by two things. Repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the book of Acts chapter 1. Repentance toward God. The night that I got saved, I was a 15-year-old kid. I knew it was time. I wish I could say that from 43 years, I, I've led a straight and narrow path. I can't. I cannot. I can't even give an account for some of the things that I've done. And at times, I can barely live with myself. Barely live with myself. I remember going forward. I'm sorry. I remember going forward at the church there beside the football field in Miller's the Sunday God building. And it was on a Sunday night. It was Palm Sunday. And I remember I said, I knelt and I thought I had to list every sin I ever but I thought maybe I'd count. Can you believe that? I began to become overwhelmed. And I said to God, I probably have sinned and didn't even know about 
how am I going to get tested? And the first thing I ever, I didn't realize it was God. I knew it. I guess I thought I understood it was God speaking to me. So I felt something say inside of me. It's okay. Just confess your sin. Wow. You see, when we're wrong, we want those who offended us to give a full account. We want them to allocate to every detail. Because we like vengeance. But God loves mercy. Mercy. Let me tell you something. I want you to be free today. I want you to be free from your past and your guilt. There was a Methodist minister. I'm sorry, I forgot I had a lapel. <laughs> that sounded like a lapel of seed. <laughs> I was coming to a great conclusion before. <laughs> oh my. Man, if you can't laugh at yourself, you know your wife will laugh at you. So. <laughs> Sister Sandy, you can come to the piano while I'm closing now. I promise not to blow my nose again. There was a Methodist minister in the 19th century who wrote these words. Long ago, long ago, I'm going to try to keep my composure. Long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today. For he washed my sins away. When the old account was set up long ago. Horatio Spafford wrote this. He said, My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I know we were going to do 201. Let's do it as well with my soul and spend. Can you do that? I don't know. We used to play a Bible sword where you had to find a Bible verse in our hurry. Remember doing that? Number, remember, it is well with my soul in the old book. Anybody going to find that? What is it? 316. It is well with my soul. I will quote to you from Charles Wesley in closing before we sing it is well with my soul and then we're going to come to the altar. I sing this to myself many a time on the way to work, many a time at night. I lie at the bottom of the bed and I feel so overwhelmed. Charles Wesley wrote, he said, No condemnation, now I pray. I am my Lord's and he is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, Never lose the wonder of your salvation, and never lose the wonder that you are justified by grace, by faith, by His blood. My sins have been removed from me as far as the east is from the west. Now there's one who will do their very best to constantly Remind you of your failure and your sin. He is the accuser of the brethren. He's going to do it again, but I learned not to do it. <clears throat> He's the accuser of the brethren. You see, he has nothing to do with the blood of Jesus. He has nothing to do with redemption. There's no hope for him. His fate is already sealed. 
And we read in Revelation about that lake of fire. Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. And so is he and the false prophet, the beast, will be thrown into the lake of fire. How can a man be justified with God? How can a man born of a woman be clean by the blood of Jesus? Will you stand with me? We're going to sing this hymn, and then we're going to open the altar. I would encourage you today, do not leave here feeling condemned. 316. That's what it is. 316 in the old hymn. But you come today. If there's something needs to be taken care of, let it be taken care of. Let a man examine himself. It says about communion. I've seen people already, they examine themselves and they don't take communion. I come and I sit down beside them. I watch. I watch them. When I pass them, I watch to see who's taking communion. If they take communion, I do sit beside them. Or I catch them along the way out the door and I say, says, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Why? Because we've taken it to Jesus and it's under the blood. You know, the good thing is I don't need to be called, I don't need to be labeled a bad dad, a rotten husband. Why do I do some of these things? I don't want you to think that wife beater, a bank robber, an adulterer. I don't need to be labeled by the things that I may or may not have done in my life. I am labeled by the righteous blood of Jesus Christ. Right. Oh. Oh. Let's say, Sam, go ahead.